Hi everyone and thank you so much for being here today with us to dive into Giving Tuesday now and how to actually build trust with your donors. Uh, I am Saoirse Rochford uh, based in Boston. Um, our, I lead our partnerships here at Nation Builder. All right, so before we actually get started, just some housekeeping. So make sure you're muted. Uh, you can do that with the microphone in the left hand side of Zoom and drop your name in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from. It's a really great way for us to actually start to know the people that are here with us in the webinar. And if you do have questions, please share them in the chat section as we go. Uh, and then we'll circle back to them during our Q&A at the end. And we have the wonderful Jane and Nelly uh, from Nation Builder here who can be kind of answering some questions if you have any issues throughout. All right, so Nation Builder and who are we? Why are we here today having this conversation? So I'm, as I said, I'm Sosha. I have been with Nation Builder for about four and a half years now. Uh, I've had a number of different roles and um, before I actually started with Nation Builder, I was running Point for a number of nonprofits and political uh, campaigns and, and candidates and running their digital infrastructure using Nation Builder. Uh, so I've had a lot of experience in that and I'm really excited to share some of that knowledge with you today. So who are we? Uh, Nation Builder is leadership software. And in our software, you have the ability to create a website, engage with your data through our CRM, and broadcast to your community via email and text. And last but definitely not least, you can also fundraise using our Nation Builder payments processor. We were founded in 2009 to democratize democracy with the strong held belief that the world needs more and better leaders. And when you think about leaders, we're not just talking about the political types, the folks that are running states and running countries. We're talking about leaders in your community, people like yourselves who are stepping up to fundraise, organize volunteers, uh, whatever it is, we really believe that we need more and better leaders. So it's our mission to strengthen democracy by offering the tools of leadership to everyone. And some of the most impactful community building best practices are actually baked into the Nation Builder platform itself. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, throughout today's webinar, I'm going to be referring to a number of different uh, studies that we've actually done here internally at Nation Builder, uh, pulling together anonymized customer data sets to understand benchmarks within fundraising, within political industry, etc. Um, and we're going to be sharing some of that knowledge with you today to get a kind of understanding of what the fundraising landscape can look like. So what are we going to cover? Up first, Giving Tuesday Now. We'll touch on what that is and how you can actually engage with it. Also getting to know your donors, right? Building those relationships, deepening those relationships, creating your fundraising strategy, the power of your reoccurring donors, and last but not least, launching your online fundraising plan. Giving Tuesday now, May 5th, 2020. It's happening next Tuesday. So at Nation Builder, we have actually partnered with Giving Tuesday now for the day of global generosity and unity on May 5th. This is a day to come together and give back in response to the unprecedented need caused by COVID-19, no matter who or where we are. Some things to think about when incorporating Giving Tuesday now into your fundraising strategy. So share good news, right? There's a lot of news that we are receiving right now in the world and it's nice to get some good news, both from your organization and maybe other stories that actually inspire you, right? Think about maybe sharing a live update of how much you have raised throughout the day or some powerful stories from your donors and your supporters. Thank them, thank your supporters, thank your donors, right? We're gonna talk more about this later on, but think about maybe hosting a virtual thankathon or creating a virtual um, like donor wall and adding your donors to it in real time. It's a great way to just kind of share with your community on how grateful you are for the work that they're doing. Speaking of being grateful, 24 hours of gratitude is a really cool concept that the Giving Tuesday team have uh, been working on. And you know, there's a number of ways you can do this, but think about maybe posting once an hour, things that your organization is grateful for. Amplify others. It's really powerful to share the great wake of work of others. If you can think about maybe splitting funds with another like-minded org, or maybe create a social media strategy, that will be a reciprocal amplification of your work and other like-minded orgs. Go live, right? People right now are really yearning to be in community with each other. And think about maybe sharing how your organization has been responding to COVID-19 and how it's actually impacted the work you're doing. You can also do this right from your couch. It's a great way to connect with your donors by going live on Giving Tuesday and sharing this content with them. 
And last but not least, make the ask, right? Don't be afraid to fundraise. Now is the time to be vulnerable. People who can help really want to help. So ask them, right? Ask your supporters to get involved in your organization virtually. Think about ways that they can actually interact with you. Maybe it's outside of actually donating. Maybe it's uh, amplifying your message. Maybe it's recruiting folks to come in and be a part of your organization. So now let's jump in to get to know your donors. Fundraising is about your people. Making the ask of someone to donate money to your organization should invite them to be a part of your mission. Your donors are unique, right? Treat them as such. It's vital though to use as much of the data that you've collected from your supporters as possible. And not just because it's gonna benefit your organization, but it will also provide the most value to the donors that you actually hope to engage with. Knowing things like when a supporter actually entered your database, what actions they've taken with you, what connections they have with other supporters or influencers in your community, um, and what they actually care about most, right? That's actually going to allow you to best request of them what you need. If you can understand how they've engaged with you historically, you can reflect that back to them, right? This data that you've gathered over years and maybe many, many years of working with these folks and your supporters can actually increase your fundraising conversion rate by up to 60%. And that's according to a recent MailChimp study of email segmentation stats. Some key findings that can make the difference, right? Number one, the longer a supporter has been engaged in your database, the more likely they are to give. So our study of the Giving Tuesday in 2019 showed that each new donor contributed an average of $85 within the first month of entering an organization's database versus an average of 130 after two years or more. That's a difference of 150%. It's gonna take time to build those types of relationships, right? Like people who've been there for two years, this is not just an easy thing that's gonna happen, but it is going to be worth it for the relationships you will build with those donors and the longevity that you'll, they'll have with your organization. Understand your donors and their relationships. So Nation Builder allows you to build relationships with your community at scale. It's imperative to have a centralized database where you can organize your donors. Your database is gonna be made up of different cohorts of supporters. They may have different issues that they care about and they almost certainly have different history of an engagement with you. If you come at everyone with the same ask, it's just gonna to be tone deaf. So before I joined Nation Builder, like I said earlier, I worked with a number of nonprofits and political organizations, and I often get really gener like generic email appeals from them, the dear friend, they're like not acknowledging how much I've donated in the past. And honestly, it makes me sad, right? I'm sure others of you in here have experienced something like this, and that's what we want to not do. The result of those types of generic asks are missed opportunities, right? So you're really gonna try, you're gonna alienate people basically who have engaged with you authentically and you're not then reflecting that back. So step one is to actually look at the data you have on your supporters and figure out what meaningful buckets you can actually carve out. So when you're thinking about that, what's actually meaningful to your organization? So think about the issues that people have self-identified, if there are geographic locations, like do you have a cluster of supporter in a particular area? And also what relationships do your supporters have between each other? Generally, these groupings that you're going to be able to identify will kind of coalesce enough people to make it worth that additional targeting that you'll do to increase your engagement. And always customize your message to them in a way that allows them to feel heard and actually be more involved with the work that you're doing. So make that relationship about more than the money. When you're thinking about your supporters, it's really important to acknowledge who they are. Your relationship absolutely should not just be about the money. Take time to actually get to know these people. You could send out something like a survey with open-ended questions for folks to share with you why they actually care about your organization. These open-ended questions are gonna give you invaluable insight into how you can best engage with your supporters moving forward. Right, so think about what actually got them interested in your cause to begin with. What led them to go from a supporter to actually being a donor? And are there other ways that they can help? Right now, we are in a time of uncertain economic um, moment. And if we know that people are struggling financially, maybe the, right, the, not, the not best thing to do is ask them for a donation. So think about other ways that folks can actually get involved with your organization right now. Last but not least is track this data. 
Over time, you're going to be able to identify trends within your supporter base, which will actually allow you to ensure that you're putting people at the center of your overarching strategy. Tailor those fundraising appeals. So our CEO, Leah Andreas, actually recently published a piece on the importance of deepening relationships with your donors. Uh, she touches in that piece on the immense value you get, your donors get from this and how it actually turns into more engaged donors as a result. So when you're thinking about that, it's key to tailor your appeals based on your campaign goals and target audiences. So make sure to adjust your calls to action based on your donor or your supporters action history. So for example, your call to action to a first time donation should be drastically different to someone who has donated to your organization historically. Customize your messaging, right? Recognize that they've either contributed in the past or that they've maybe just signed a petition and this is a first time donation ask and remind them why they personally became a supporter. So thinking back to those survey components, if you use open-ended questions, you'll be able to reflect that back to a donor. And what we see is around 30 to 40% higher engagement on those emails that have personal calls to action, not just you know, someone's name, but actually a data point that you're able to leverage and engage with them in a more personal meaning. So staying in communication with your donors. During the global pandemic, it is vital that you're able to communicate with your folks. Identify which medium your community engages with best. So this could be both text and email, but for different types of asks. For example, a donor journey with multiple asks, right? So maybe your first ask is, can you donate $2 today? Your second ask is, can you recruit three friends and family to be involved? That's gonna be better served by an email series. While as a day of giving, right, so such as next Tuesday, giving Tuesday now, that's going to be better suited maybe to an immediate text strategy that actually allows folks to donate from a text blast with the URL you put in there. So really think about those mediums that you're reaching out to folks, whether it's text, email, a combination of both, maybe it's some direct mail. And now that we can't be in, uh, in physical communication with each other, thinking about the best ways to leverage your digital and direct mail strategies. All of these should be segmented, right? So break out your messaging again based on how that donor's interacted with you in the past. Think about your reoccurring donors versus one-time donors, people who maybe had attended an event in the past, people that are fundraisers in your community. All of these messages should be different. So how do you actually segment those audiences? There's a number of different ways to think about this, right? So slicing and dicing, getting to get some grounding in why you're reaching out to these people. Up first is that behavior component, how they've actually oriented and engaged with you historically. So what we're seeing here in one of the reports we did is that donors who've actually RSVP'd for an event gave 34% more than donors who hadn't engaged in events. The other thing to think about in this is the incremental ask. So if a donor has given $165 in the past, you can make an incremental ask to ask them to increase that donation, but only because you have the knowledge of what they've donated historically. Again, thinking back to how have they, how have they previously acted within my organization? The next thing to think about here is your persona. So those baseline demographics that allow you to understand what your ideal donor persona is. So thinking about if someone is a supporter and has been for the last you know, two, three years in your organization, what we've seen is that they are more likely to give 150% more than folks who've been in your organization for maybe a month or less. <laughs> the other thing to think about here is if you've ever solicited information about your supporters' skills, the issues they care about, maybe their employment, things like that, it's really important to tap into those attributes about people because it allows you again to personalize your content and engage with them in a really meaningful way. So now coming into how do you think about cultivating ambassadors within your current audiences? You wanna find those influencers or existing champions within your audience. And it's important to understand the reach that your donors or your supporters have within their own networks. You can really leverage this by creating things like a social media ambassador program. It's a great program for people who actually might not be able to participate financially, but they can amplify your message. So what you're seeing on the screen is an example of a filter that you can use in Nation Builder 
to understand the reach that some of your people have. So for example, here we're saying is greater than or equal to 5,000 Twitter followers. So that individual has that own reach within their network. We're also getting a little bit even narrower there thinking about, okay, of those, I wanna know how many people are actually following my organization and have donated either $50 or more. And the most recent donation was actually on the beginning of this year. So really, really thinking about how can you leverage those people who have an expansive network to amplify your message moving forward. Set those ambassadors up for success. It is really important that if you create a ambassador program that you're actually giving them the tools that they need to engage with your content and amplify your message. So what you're seeing here is the graphic from Giving Tuesday Now. Uh, Giving Tuesday as an entity has a number of toolkits that are available freely online for everyone to engage with from nonprofit orgs to small businesses to corporations to political, anyone who is trying to engage with the concept of a day of national giving for COVID. So within your organization, you can also create that content yourself, right? And make sure that you're sending that out to those ambassadors. So there's a copy and paste whatever is the tweet that you want them to send out, whatever hashtag you're using to amplify your message is going to be really, really key. This also allows you to just completely distribute leadership to your supporters. It gives them a chance to buy in to what you're doing and actually have a stake in the ground with how they can impact your particular mission. And lastly, remind them to share on the day of. There's a lot going on right now and people are being pulled in a thousand different directions. So please, please, please make sure that you are in constant communication with your folks to amplify your message, especially on Giving Tuesday when there's going to be, Giving Tuesday now, when there's going to be a lot of noise, make sure that you can actually stay above the noise with your people. So when you're thinking about the ambassador programs, you wanna make sure that this isn't just like a one minute thing. This isn't just gonna disappear after Giving Tuesday now. So enable them to actually have the tools to be year long recruiters for you. What you're seeing on the screen is what we call a social share prompt. So in Nation Builder, every time someone shares an action, they'll be prompted with this social share prompt, which will give them a personal recruiter ID and it will be appended to their post. So for example, if I tweeted this out right now and a few of you clicked on it, within my control panel, I would then be able to get credit for the fact that I recruited Roland and Patrick and Nelly. It's a really great way to actually engage with the organic recruitment that will happen within your supporter base. The other thing to note here on the right hand side are personal fundraising pages. We'll talk more about this later on in the webinar, but I just wanted to flag this for you here. If we think about again that distribution of leadership, giving someone a personal fundraising page allows them to take complete ownership of what they're doing for your organization. You can see that this is branded by myself. I've given a little bio of who I am and that I'm fundraising for puppies in this particular example. And then I have a goal of $10,000. That button right there on the bottom where it says donate on behalf of Social Rochford will give me as Social Rochford credit for recruiting any single donor that comes in. Again, a great way to ensure that you're distributing leadership and amplifying the work you're doing out in the world. Okay, so how are we communicating with these folks? One last minute email is not gonna cut it when you're thinking about your overarching fundraising goals. <coughs> so you wanna start building anticipation, right? Early and with regular digital comms and with a regular cadence. Only 25% of donations logged last Giving Tuesday actually came from an email blast from Nation Builder customer data. It's really important to think about the longevity of your fundraising strategy. It shouldn't just be a one time and done. If you're sending one email a month, you need to be cognizant of internet service providers, in particular, Gmail throttling. So if you're sending um, you know, thousands and thousands of emails, it can be flagged with Gmail if that cadence actually changes in a dramatic way. So one email a month, if that's your normal regular cadence, then flipping that to maybe five emails in a week, that's gonna raise some flags with internet service providers. So be sure to actually do this in a regular cadence to increase your email sends to ensure your deliverability and make sure that you are actually getting to the people's inboxes that you want to make the ask of. The other thing to think about here, because this is at scale, right? So this is sending at scale. 
you should invest in one-to-one -one outreach, right? Your most valuable and potential donors and fundraisers are people that you should be thinking about. How can I communicate with them outside of email blasts, right? Maybe it's one-to-one -one phone calls. There's a, spe uh, a specific audience that you can identify a criteria set of. Maybe it's people who have a particular social following that have donated over a thousand dollars to you, but really thinking about how can you engage with them on a one-to-one -one basis. What you can see here are again the stats from that study we did. So 43% larger donations after a one-to-one -one contact. You're making people feel heard. And I know this might be unreasonable if you have thousands and thousands of donors, but think about how you can actually cr cut that criteria down. Lastly, 53% more donations were fundraised after one-to-one -one contact. We think back to that personal fundraising page, again, giving ownership to the individuals themselves of how they can amplify and impact your message we're seeing additional 53% increase in people who are fundraising after they've been contacted one-to-one -one by your org. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into actually creating your fundraising strategy. So Giving Tuesday now has given people in the nonprofit industry a unique moment during an extremely challenging time to raise awareness and money for your causes. Uh, in this section, I want to get you thinking about your overall fundraising strategy and how you can actually use historical data to determine your fundraising goals. Right now, we are all in uncharted territory, but it is still important to understand what your historical fundraising engagement has been so that you can actually create necessary benchmarks for your teams that are fundraising. We need to remember that Giving Tuesday Now is also is not just about donors giving to incredible organizations. It's about organizations giving thousands of people the chance to be pulled closer together and actually be a part of something. Community, right? This is something that we know people are yearning for right now. So use Giving Tuesday in a manner that actually allows for community to build and not necessarily just a donation ask. All right. So let's get into what your fundraising strategy can be based on historical benchmarks. So a way to think about this is to reverse engineer your strategy for reaching your goal through an evaluation of your previous fundraising efforts. So for example, let's say your 2020 fundraising goal is $250,000. You wanna start by listing your benchmarks from 2019 and then know your inputs for 2020. So how large was your supporter list? We're saying in 2019, it was 50K. What percent of those folks actually gave money to your organization? So 4%, that's working out at about 2K donors. And then understanding what was your average donation throughout the year? So we're saying here it was $100, which gives us a $200,000 increment in 2019. Now we wanna think about how can we actually get to that $250,000 target goal? And we're going to keep things simple and assume that our list hasn't fully grown. So we're still kind of marking around the 50,000 in total supporters. So what inputs can we actually change to hit this 250K goal? Okay, so assuming that the average donation stays the same, the increase in the number of people who donate, we can get 2,500, right? So we're thinking about here, what in my program, in my donation strategy, can I do to increase that 50,000 supporters instead of being 2,000, actually being 2,500. So that again, there's no, that's not net new in terms of supporters, it's net new in terms of donors as you're thinking about your overall supporter base. Another way to think about this is actually increasing your fund, fundraising program's conversion rate by 1%. So in other words, you're actually increasing the breadth of your donor base. So that will uptick your conversion to 5%. <coughs> Excuse me. Or I know we had said like not thinking about net new acquisition, there's a world in which you can think about, okay, I want 500 new donors to get to that 2,500 donor mark if our average donation is staying the same at $100. The other option here is to increase the average revenue per donor by $25, right? So we've seen in 2019, we had a $100 donor. If we focus our messaging on increasing that by $25, this is another way to hit our $250,000 goal. So what I'm trying to get you guys to think about here is like, what are the historical benchmarks that you can kind of plug in to your fundraising strategy moving forward? Giving Tuesday Now is definitely going to be a part of it, but what you really wanna think about is how can your overarching strategy continue on during this pandemic? and figuring out the levers that you can pull at to ensure that you are engaging with as many people as possible will be really important to do that. 
Okay, so up next, the power of reoccurring donors. So research shows that on average, people who are reoccurring donors versus one-time donors, even if they give once multiple times, that those reoccurring donors give up to 40% more on average within a year and also have a higher lifetime value over their entire relationship to your organization. So it, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? To take folks who are giving to you once on Giving Tuesday on a path to actually cultivate the relationship into a reoccurring donor. The thing that's actually really interesting about this is that people have some serious trepidation around reaching out to first-time donors too quickly. What we've seen is that this actually isn't the right approach. We have actually found that donors are far more likely to become re re reoccurring donors if you make your second ask within 30 to 60 days of that original ask. Again, don't be afraid to ask. People will forget if you're not reminding them why they made that first donation in, uh, in the first place, right? The other thing to think about here is like ongoing predictable cash flow that you can actually depend on. Right? If you have reoccurring donors, that is a way that you can actually identify, okay, I have for this month an incoming of 100K, as opposed to maybe I get a $10,000 donation and a $200 donation. It's predictability within your actual incoming month over month. Again, back to that greater lifetime value and higher retention, right? Two to three times greater annual revenue uh, versus that one-time donor. It's really important to think about that and getting your folks into it. On the right-hand side, what you're seeing here is a Nation Builder customer's donation page and the immediate prompt being to become a monthly sponsor. So when they're using the Nation Builder payment processor, you're actually able here to have this option of becoming a monthly sponsor, right? Or a one-time donor, but that's the default prompt is to get them into that reoccurring consistency. Awesome, all right. So now we're gonna go into the last phase, which is launching your online fundraising. Optimizing it. <clears throat> Excuse me, just having a little sip of some iced coffee. All right, so with all of our actions limited to online right now, we've got to be creative with how we're engaging with our community for fundraising. Pledges are really successful when driven by your organization's super supporters. So again, creating a fundraising program where you have fundraisers engage with their networks to bring net new donors to your organization. Also think about using a money bomb page. Does everyone know what a money bomb page is? I'm seeing some yeses and some noes. Okay, cool. Um, so money bomb page allows you to actually create urgency using a time bound period for those pledges to come into your organization. Text keywords are also another great way to give folks uh, to engage with your fundraising strategy right from their phone. So using a keyword will drive engagement outside of email and will then drive them back to your website if you want to create a, you know, a specific user journey from a text keyword. Personal fundraising pages, right? So they are a really, really important way to distribute leadership with your community. And these pages actually allow for supporters to own their own success when it comes to fundraising on your organization's behalf. You can also actually create some fun competition with your fundraisers using this concept of a leaderboard. So I think thinking about how do you engage your, um, your fundraisers, your donors, to take a stake and ownership in your uh, organization. Allow them to be creative with how much they can contribute, whether that is you know, $10,000 in a year, $200 in a year, whatever that is, let that to be flexible for those individual donors to choose from. And last but not least is a virtual thankathon. So has anyone ever received like an unexpected thank you for something that you did? No, no. Yeah, okay. So I actually did the other day and I swear I just like got a moment of like, yes, oh my God, thank you. Um, so I got a phone call the other day from a campaign I've been involved with to just that just called me to say thank you. And it was a really personal moment where everything is happening around us, but taking a, you know, 10 steps back to actually go through your list and one-to-one -one call in a phone bank and getting your supporters involved in that. So creating a Zoom link like we have right now, giving folks a script and giving them a list to call through and just doing a virtual thankathon. It's a great way to build community. It's also a great way to engage with your donors uh, by giving them that personal touch and not just sending an email to say thanks for being involved. 
Up next, deepening your relationships. So in times of crisis, building and deepening your relationships is more important than ever. Uh, and during a period of only online interactions, you need to get creative about how you are deepening relationships with your donors. Relying on the leaders within your community to connect with their networks will allow you to increase peer-to-peer -peer giving, right? By doing this, you're actually distributing your leadership, which enables you to promote the leaders in your community, giving them that deeper sense of responsibility to your organization's mission. And while we can't be in person with each other, there is a lot of technology that enables you to connect with your community virtually. If you had events scheduled, think about how you can actually port these events over to digital, and we'll touch on that in a second. The other thing here is to encourage your donors to share their story, right? Why are they actually connected to your mission? What has the money that they've raised for you helped with? Give people actionable things to resonate with in terms of what their money will help with and why it's important. And it's always been important to be personal in your outreach to donors, but now more than ever, you should ensure that you're communicating to them using all of the data that they've shared with you over the years. Right? It's really, really important to have that engaged in your digital plan because if you're contacting voters in a blanket fashion, they're going to start to disengage with you. Another thing to note here is handwritten notes can actually be a really powerful way. I know we're constantly thinking about digital, but doing those personal touches can go a long way in the longevity of a donor with your organization. Back to that magic money bomb page. So on the right hand side of the screen, you're seeing what that actually looks like on a front facing site. So you get this concept of a countdown timer to create that urgency we talked about. It also allows you to actually collect pledges and then do specific outreach to them based on the pledge amount. Great way to think about that, right? Giving Tuesday now is coming up on Tuesday next week, maybe tomorrow or on Saturday, you could actually launch a money bomb page that will end on Monday night so that you can then immediately reach out to those folks and say, okay, Giving Tuesday now is here. We have one day to get that money that you have pledged and it allows you an additional touch point to engage with them outside of your normal fundraising strategy. Also, the auto responses that come from these are a great way to add key messaging into your donors audiences. So make sure you're always customizing any auto response that comes from any action page, whether that's a money bomb, a petition, donation page itself. Having that customized touch within that email allows your donors to again, feel more personally connected to your organization. And last but not least is tagging your people. So understanding how they are self-identifying with issues that they care about is a key way to be able to, again, reflect that data back to them in the long run. And the last thing we're gonna to touch on today is virtual fundraisers. So I've broken this out into three sections. So before the event, during the event and post event. So fundraisers are a really important part of events for a lot of nonprofits out there right now. And I'm sure a bunch of you folks actually had fundraisers planned in the coming weeks or months. Uh, hopefully from today's session, you will actually be able to get some ideas around how you can do this. So before you're jumping into your event, think about, <coughs> excuse me, moving your fundraiser online. You want to do some additional outreach to folks than you would normally do for an in-person event. So we touched on this earlier, but surveying your RCPs is going to be key to ensure that you actually have information on why they want to be a part of your fundraiser in the first place. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, I'm hosting a fundraiser to build an animal shelter in my local neighborhood. Uh, before that event, I'm going to send out a survey to all of the RCPs so I can ask them what types of animals they actually have at home. Excuse me. In doing that, I'm able to then get that data and use that data in my event, right? So I'm able to say, okay, these 15 people have dogs, these 15 people have cats. I'm going to put them together based on the commonality that they've shared with me publicly so that I can actually start to build relationships within my community. Again, this is before the event, so you can actually have some actionable data. Again, touching on the money bomb and the personal fundraising pages, just a great way to amplify your event and allow people to involve themselves and put that stake in the ground during your event. So if your fundraiser was originally an event that had, you know, maybe keynote speakers or some type of fireside chat, it's really important to actually prep with those folks beforehand to ensure that they can deliver whatever the content is necessary in a virtual manner. As you saw at the top here, I had some technical difficulties myself and I do this every single day. So it's really, really key to prep your speakers when you are going into a virtual format. 
Also during the event, you could do a screen share with all of your attendees where they can actually see a live don donation thermometer ticking up as more and more people donate. People like to see that other folks are doing something. There is a premise in the political outreach world that people need to see at least seven other individuals do something before they engage into whatever the, your ask is. So think about how can you show this dynamically to these folks live to increase that um, thermometer as it's happening. The other thing is thinking about using a texting program during the event. So if your group is larger than 100, this actually would be a really great way to try and create some uh, you know, immediate community whilst in the event. If it's smaller than 100, this could feel a little bit less authentic because you have the ability to kind of chat with each other either one-on-one -on -one or in those breakout groups that you can do in things like Zoom or Microsoft Teams. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you've got that smaller group, right, think about those breakout sessions and opportunities for folks to maybe network live. So if I come back to that survey that I said I was doing before the event, I could actually break people out into the groups based on the animals that they said that they've had at home and give them a prompt, right? So I'm going to send you off into your breakout groups and you will come back with ideas to the larger group so that you're making your fundraiser interactive and allowing for those kind of networking moments that you would normally get at a fundraiser, uh, but in a virtual experience. Last but not least is post-event. So follow-up is absolutely key. It is key for all types of fundraising, whether that is a virtual event uh, or if it is just you know, a day of giving, things like that, but your follow-up is really, really important. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you're going to actually need to be really diligent in how you follow up with these folks. So if we continue on with that example of the animal shelter fundraiser, I could follow up in a couple of groups. So number one would be to introduce all of those people from the breakout sessions with the ask that they actually go and create personal fundraising pages based on the ideas that they came up with for their particular animal that they want to rescue. That's one example of how I could segment that out, that follow up. The other is looking at how can I break this out by all attendees? So I can think about made a donation during the event. They pledged on the Money Bomb page, but actually did not donate during the live event. They RSVP'd, but did not attend, but they did donate. And then lastly, they RSVP'd, did not attend, and did not donate. So those are four very distinct groups of people that have one thing in common, that they RSVP'd for the event. All of these should have specific content tailored to the bucket in which they are in and thinking about specifically again reflecting back. So if they RSVP'd and did not attend but did donate, you want to make that engagement really specific to the fact of, you know, we're so sorry we missed you, but thank you so much for your X number of donations and have a call to action in that. Maybe that call to action is as simple as we'd love for you to recruit five friends and family to come next on again really specific to how they actually engage with your organization as a whole. Okay I just spoke for a solid 30 minutes so I'm going to flip it into questions with this whole crew. Please please ah uh, can I see questions? I'm going to open the chat and hope I don't break everything. Um, okay. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. For real? Can you create a Money Bomb page with Nation Builder? You can, yes. Uh, Money Bomb is a Nation Builder page type that you can use. This is a silent bunch. Suggestions for software to use in a live event, classy, give smart. Uh, depends on what you're trying to do. Like I, I've actually been to one uh, recent virtual fundraiser that use Zoom and use that breakout rooms functionality. There also are polls. If you're doing like the, the auction component, like the silent auction, I think give smart and, and classy also have that functionality. Um, so yeah, not silent. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Um, my charity is counseling for abused women, children. How can I ask the donors what their connection is to our work? It is so personal. Um, that is a really good question, Jan. Um, counseling for abused women, children. How can I ask the donors what their connection is to our work? It is so personal. 
I honestly story and your and the narrative of how and why people are involved in your organization is so powerful I think with such a sensitive subject and, and a very personal subject uh one-to-one -one outreach will be key in how you garnish that information about why people are connected to your work uh but it definitely would be a I would recommend one-to-one -one outreach as opposed to, to outreach at scale but I think you'll also be surprised with the willingness that people have to share their story and share their narrative. Um, and thank you for the, the work you're doing, John. Okay. Um, money bomb. Okay. Well, if you don't have any other questions, oh, I do, okay. Where Anish Milder, can you track moves management with a donor's recode from initial prospect research, initial contact, solicitor, assignment, cultivation activities, engagement opportunities to solicitation, stewardship, back once again to cultivation. Okay, so you're talking about donor management. There's a number of ways you can do that in Anish Milder. Uh, up first would be our path functionality. And so having a path within Nation Builder that tracks everything you just outlined there, right? So initial prospect research. If you're doing your initial prospect research on donors, thinking about your criteria set or your persona identification for an ideal donor, using the individual, like the CRM component of our software to then map that back, those data points, whether it's demographic data points, geographic, um, industry, et cetera, you can map those in either custom fields or native fields. And then you would create a path which would allow you to basically take that prospective donor on the journey to becoming a donor right and going back through again through cultivation um and we can make sure to share patrick with you path uh, like how to get started on paths in nation builder in our follow-up um is there a how-to manual to create personal fundraising pages to send to ambassadors within toolkit um yes we have a couple of different how-to guides as it relates to creating personal fundraising pages it's actually um pretty easy and I'm going to try and not break the internet and show you in a nation. All right, are we still seeing my screen? Everything good? Great, okay. So I am gonna jump over here into the people database and I'm gonna go into my profile and I will show you how I created my personal fundraising page. So I jump over here to Social Rochford. In the individual's profile, you can navigate down here into the edit section. Great. And on the right hand side, you'll be able to identify that this individual is a fundraiser. So you can check that box on and check it off. And you can also then give them a fundraising goal. What that does is actually enable you to on that person's public profile, give a fundraising goal. So now if I go over into my public profile, I can see in here where I can add some additional information. And then if I go to the front facing live site of that, what I'll see is that fundraising goal that is set in the edit section comes up right here and the amount that people have raised on my behalf comes up right here. So if I click on donate on behalf of Social Rochford, that brings me over to a donation page. But what you'll notice in the URL is this recruiter ID functionality. That is what is attributing that donation to me. Uh, awesome. Okay. So that's how you set up a personal fundraising page, but I'll make sure to also get that over to you in the documentation. Um, amazing, there are lots of questions. Okay, so some organizations suggest that donors add the credit card processing fee to their online gift. How do you feel about this, especially with monthly repeating donations, which may be smaller amounts? That definitely is up to you as an organization of whether or not you want to pass on those fees. I think it really depends on the size of your nonprofit and what your revenue and your bottom line is to be able to implement at giving basic like the pass back of whatever those transaction fees are um, to your end donor. Um, okay, I came in late, linked to video recording. Sorry if I missed an earlier enough. Yes, Mark will definitely get you the recording. There's some funkiness at the top um with tech and i apologize for that uh what different techniques would you use for political versus charity fundraising oh that's a great question um i think there's two tracks in the political to think about one is like candidate specific so if i'm a candidate running for office versus political action right so i'm a entity that is endorsing multiple candidates that 
I align with their particular mission. So if you're in the candidate driven space, that's going to be all tied to your personal policy stance. Your, if you're um, running on a party ticket, if you're running as an independent, um, and again, the engagement there though should still be very, very personal, but you're, you're working on a more um, like condensed deadline. So you've got to think about like your quarter end, the creating emergency around filing deadlines, creating emergency around specific things that are happening uh, from a political landscape and a policy lens. Whereas if you're in the pack realm, you're thinking more about the larger overarching narrative and how you can influence and move voters to actually turn out and vote and engage with you in that particular mechanism as opposed to a candidate. You also have a lot more like uh, freedom wiggle room um, when it comes to PAC, uh, like fundraising, political fundraising, as you do as a candidate. So that there's some very like clear dis like delineations between the two. Um, okay. Thanks for the great ideas. I got to get going on building momentum. Amazing, Jan. We'll be sending. Uh, okay. Our database does not allow matching gift information about an employer's potential to match a donor's gift. Why is that? I am not 100% sure, Patrick, but um, if you shoot over a response to the email to, that we send out tomorrow, I will have our support team look into that for you. Awesome. I think I got everyone's questions. I've got like another 10 minutes or so if anyone wants to, to ask a question. Also, feel free to unmute. Thank you for joining, Alan. I'm really glad. I'm, I'm glad it was helpful for everyone. Uh, what would you, what would be your recommendations on starting a donor strategy? Uh, that is a great question, Vincent. So I think the key on a donor strategy is understanding your, like your target audience. So what are the specific demographics that meet your criteria set? Are you looking specifically at an issue that aligns with one gender or another? Are you looking at a specific issue that is predominantly impacting millennials versus a different age group? Uh, so understanding those demographics and the personas, uh, political ideology is also a thing to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, political ideology is also a thing to incorporate when you're thinking about a donor strategy. Um, you know, people who lean in a certain way politically may have a larger opportunity to engage with you uh, in one way or another. Um, and the other is geography, right? Is this a geographical issue that you're thinking about? Can you um, specifically target in geographic locations and that then goes into your stakeholder engagement, right? So thinking about are there local chambers of commerce that you can get to be um, endorsers and influencers of your particular charitable um, you know, plan and, and strategy and thinking about the influences in your space that you can kind of acknowledge and create a strategy around to spread and further your message for donor acquisition. But there's, there's a lot in like donor strategy. Is there any way to custom my to custom ask for different segments using formulas? Yes, yes, there are. We tried to do this using a smart field as part of an email campaign, but there seems to be limited options. Yeah. So within your smart field, no, because that's going to be a hard coded liquid variable. Um, but liquid is the language that we use in both our, our website CMS and in the email uh, to be able to pull in that data set. So you can use liquid logic to say if your last gift was a hundred dollars times that by three for recommended gift. Um, and you'd have to put that into the actual, like you'd actually have to write out the, the liquid logic, but I can uh, make sure that you get, we've got a bunch of resources on liquid logic. I can make sure we get that to you. Is there a repository of best practices, excellent nation builder websites to review and probably still ideas from? Um, absolutely. We, so Jane actually, who, who's on the call here, does a lot of work with all of us in there of what they're doing in Nation Builder um, and our year in review is probably a really fantastic resource for you to, to get some ideas of strategies that our customers are doing uh, but I'll let Jane jump in if there's somewhere else that I'm not thinking of uh, in terms of resources. 
So definitely feel free to check out nationbuilder.com slash blog. Uh, that is our central content hub where you can find resources, you know, not only to, um, you know, help you learn more about Nation Builder, but um, help get you inspired for different kinds of campaigns that you can do. Um, if you sc scroll down, there's a section called Get Equipped that has some guides, more recorded webinars like this one, and case studies, as well as, you know, near the bottom of the page, uh, customer stories of, um, you know, successes from within our community. So I thoroughly encourage folks to check that out. Thanks, Jane. Um, and the other actually thing on that, if you're on Facebook, Vincent, we have a really active uh, Nation Builder Facebook community where people kind of go back and forth on different ideas uh, and how to leverage the software in the best ways. All right. Like the page. Awesome. Okay. Well, I would just like to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone for coming today. Um, Giving Tuesday is, is next Tuesday. Uh, so we will be keeping an eye out. If you have exciting stuff that you're doing, please do tag uh, Nation Builder in those posts. We wanna see what you're doing. Uh, and we would love to, to be a part of what you're doing for Giving Tuesday Now. And don't forget the hashtag Giving Tuesday Now. Um, also for the folks who aren't Nation Builder customers here, please feel free, go ahead, start a trial. Uh, you'll get kind of paired up with our amazing onboarding specialist team. Uh, and for those of you that are customers, thank you so much for being in it with us for many years. Good to see you all. Oh, you have many questions, but started officially working as the outreach coordinator this last Monday. Oh, awesome. Okay, yes. Beginning to learn about this. Diane, thank you. Brilliant. And Craig, always good to see you. Craig was an old customer of mine, and I'm excited to see him in a much larger space. <laughs> all right. Bye, folks. Thank you so much for coming.